Good morning and welcome once again to St. Mark's Darling Point for this our service of Holy Communion. It is a service of the Lord's Supper, so you might like to get some bread and wine so you can join in the meal that we share, remembering Jesus' death a little bit later in the service. For now, let's stand and proclaim the praises of our God in song. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
Lord, have mercy upon us, and write all these thy law in our hearts, we beseech thee. The Collect Epistle and Gospel for this the third Sunday after Easter. Almighty God, who shows to them that be in error the light of thy truth, to the intent that they may return into the way of righteousness, grant unto all them that are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion, that they may eschew those things that are contrary to their profession, and follow all such things as are agreeable to the same, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The passage appointed for the epistle is written in the 29th chapter of Genesis, beginning at the 15th verse. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah, Leah's eyes were beautiful, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed but to him a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of that place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So Jacob went in to Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has looked on my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she named him Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be joined to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore he was named Levi. She conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she named him Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Here endeth the epistle. The Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 10, beginning at the 28th verse. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake or for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be unto thee, O Lord, for this thy holy gospel. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, 
whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look at the res for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, hi. Welcome to St. Mark's. I'm Tim Escott. I'll be opening the Bible for us this morning. So let's ask for God's help as we look at it together. Our Father, we thank you that all Scripture is breathed out by you and useful for us and to show us the way of salvation. And we pray now that you would be with us and help us to understand and to be transformed. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that reading from Genesis 29 is one of the most dramatic scenes in the whole Bible. Love, joy, deception, bigamy, neglect, infertility, and bitter sadness in a deeply dysfunctional family. And, you know, I think passages like this can be so puzzling for us. You know, aren't we supposed to open the Bible and find edifying stories of faithfulness, goodness and love? The ugly power of a story like this is that it distills so much of our own experiences of relational and familial difficulty and doesn't seem to offer us any hope or promise of fulfillment. You know, if, if these are the families of the Bible, what hope is there? And what's more, this family is supposed to be God's chosen family, the family who God will bless and through whom blessing, renewal and healing is supposed to come to the world. But instead we have this unedifying thicket of passions and naked human characteristics. It's so hopeless and far from fulfilment. So what hope is there for Jacob's family, for God's promises to bring peace and blessing? What hope is there for our own families? Well, as we look at this next chapter of Jacob's story, it actually begins with a fulfilled family life. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen how Jacob's deceptive and thieving ways alienated him from his family. His brother wanted to murder him, so he fled to the north alone in exile. But even there, God graciously appeared to this unlikely man and promised to bless him with family, land and blessing and to protect him while he's away from home. And so with Genesis 29, it looks like God starts to fulfill those promises for family and blessing because when he arrives at his destination, Jacob meets the love of his life, his future wife, Rachel. He arrives in the land of his ancestors. He stops at a well and while he's asking the local shepherds if they know his relatives, his beautiful cousin Rachel turns up. He's so energized at the sight of her that he heroically rolls away the stone from the, from the top of the well. He waters her sheep, kisses her and emotionally bursts into tears. And so she runs home and tells her father Laban and he runs out and embraces Jacob as a long-awaited-for kinsman and future son-in-law. And what makes it all the more auspicious is that all of this sounds a lot like chapter 24 of Genesis, when Jacob's mum and dad, Isaac and Rebekah, get together. Well, that went well for them, so this will too, right? And that's where our reading picks up. Jacob is head over heels for Rachel. She's so graceful and beautiful that he agrees to work for her father for seven years to earn her hand in marriage. And those years seem like but a few days because of the love he had for her. Now, it's a beautiful love story. And you know, isn't this the kind of thing that we want? Maybe not marrying our cousins or paying a bride price. But these cultural differences aside, this kind of energized love is exciting. This kind of solidarity and peace is what we want in our families, in our relationships. But compared to the sometimes bored familiarity or tiresome squabbling or the pain of divorce or estrangement or loneliness, this, kind of, this is the kind of thing that we long and hope for. And so at this point, it looks like God is coming through with his promises. He's fulfilling his promises for family, 
blessing and renewal. But suddenly, the story flips on its head. Because after seven long years of working for the love of his life, Jacob finally marries her, but somehow Jacob's uncle Laban manages to pull a switcheroo and Jacob wakes up to find he's married to Leah, Rachel's older sister. And you know, in some ways, it's, it's ridiculous, a ridiculous story. How could that possibly happen? You could fill in the blanks and guess you know, maybe it had something to do with, with a veiled bride, too much alcohol, uh, the darkness, and Leah's involvement in the switch. But it doesn't say. That the point is that Jacob has received a hefty dose of his own medicine. The deceiver has been deceived. The trickster tricked. Just like Jacob took advantage of his father, and switched places with his older brother. So Laban takes advantage of Jacob and switches the older for the younger. And so Jacob ends up having to work for another seven years to marry Rachel. And so it seems that God is using Laban to teach Jacob a hard lesson. Because even though Jacob began to respond to God well in the last chapter, He still has a long way to go. He's still so self-dependent and forthright. And he goes back to his deceiving ways later, later on too. Jacob has to learn the value of peace with his family and to depend on God. And so one of the things we can say in the thicket of our own conflicts and struggles is that in God's grace... He can use them to shape us and discipline us. Now, these can be really hard lessons that sometimes can only be be perceived with hindsight. And, you know, it's not to say that this makes them good or we should excuse abuse or, or mistreatment or even that we can't be really damaged by them. But it does say that even as we experience conflict and relational distress, God can use those difficulties to shape us and mould us, to teach us patience and forgiveness, gentleness and graciousness, and teach us to depend on God in the midst of our weakness and our pain. And yet, the Jacob story, it's, it's not quite so neat as that. You know, it's not like Jacob learns his lesson and then everyone's happy. Jacob and Laban are far from their original embrace and declaration of their kinship when they first met. And Jacob now has two wives and he loves Rachel more than Leah. Leah is unloved and bitterly sad. She even names her children based on the affliction and hate that she feels and the longing that she has for love and affection from her neglectful husband. And you see in the next chapter, Rachel can't have children. So the pain of her infertility makes her bitterly jealous and she yearns to have children like her sister. And not to mention that these poor women have been treated like possessions to be sold by their father and used and neglected by their husband. And so the whole thing is is desperate and pathetic picture. There's no fulfilled family life here. It's an unfulfilled family and unfulfilled promises from God. And it's also a picture that reflects in a concentrated way what our families can be like, of the way parents and children can neglect and take advantage of each other, of the way men can treat women as objects, of the pain of infertility, of rivalry and envy that comes out of pain and of the way when things are looking so good we can be blindsided by deception or tragedy and our families turned upside down. You know, right now we find ourselves in, ex- in an extraordinary social situation. You know, we're either in enhanced isolation or in relational intensity with the other people in our homes. 
And so many of you feel these things in especially acute ways. The pain of separation from your spouse or your children or your siblings. The heat of conflict and contempt and the coldness of distance and deceit. And the point of Jacob's story is that these things are deep inside us. They go back to the first lies and blame shifting of Adam and Eve in the garden, to the envy and murder of the first siblings, Cain and Abel, and they continue in us today. And so what we need then isn't just some moral lessons that we can learn from or even lessons on how to forgive or be patient. What we need is a more fundamental transformation and fulfillment that only God can bring. Did you notice that God actually doesn't appear in all of chapter 29? After he appears at the end of chapter 28 making those promises, Jacob doesn't mention God again. And the only time he shows up is in verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. Even in the midst of this unfulfilled family life, God graciously fulfills his promises for family and blessing. Despite her cruel and conniving ways, God gives children to Rachel. Despite Jacob's ongoing ambivalence, he moves Jacob from being an empty-handed fugitive to a blessed man with a huge family and great wealth. And God doesn't wait until these people are better and have it all together. He blesses them and the world through them, despite and in the middle of this conflicted, dysfunctional family. I think for us, this means two things as we look for God's grace in our own families. The first is that through Jacob's children, God was working to bring peace and create a new worldwide family in Jesus Christ. Leah's fourth child is Judah. And through Judah's descendants, the kings of Israel came and our Lord Jesus came. He was the seed of Jacob who brings blessing to the world, even through the awful treachery and sadness of his death on the cross. Jesus enables us to come into a new family, to be children of God. And not to erase our natural families, but to allow us to treasure each other as brothers and sisters. Sadly, this spiritual family can still display some of the dysfunction and dissension that characterize Jacob's family. But by God's grace and through the work of his spirit, he enables us to grow in patience, love and forgiveness. And so we have a present and future hope of a renewed family life in Jesus Christ and with his people. Now, maybe you're from a great family, a loving family. And so it's important for you to remember that your ultimate hope is in Jesus Christ's family. But if you're from a really difficult family or no family, Remember that you have a spiritual family by God's grace, somewhere to love and be loved. But the second way that we can find God's grace in our families is that we need to entrust ourselves to God to make our family and relational life strong. Now, if you're from a great family, don't fall into the trap of thinking that this is your own doing. It's a gift of God. And likewise, if you want peace, children or healing, they won't come simply from our grasping over them. Now, yes, we can use me- the means around us, medicine, wisdom, but in the end, it is God who gives these things out of his grace and God who gives us strength to persevere. The same God who saw Leah's mistreatment and sadness is the same God The same gracious God who delights to bless you in his own way, in his own time. And so today, as you listen to God through this unlikely story, 
I invite yourself, I invite you to entrust yourself to the God from whom everything good comes, who is able to enrich you and bless your home even in the face of dysfunction and hostility and pain, and who, even through the dysfunctional family of Jacob, is creating a new family, brothers, brothers and sisters, with Jesus Christ as our brother and God our loving and gracious Father. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Now is the time for our offertory hymn. I remind uh, our members uh, to give electronically uh, or by sending a check. Uh, this is your time to respond. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church militant here in earth. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity and concord and grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also to save and defend all Christian kings, princes and governors, and especially thy servant Elizabeth our Queen, that under her we may be godly and quietly governed, and grant unto her whole council and to all that are put in authority under her that they may truly and indifferently minister justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy holy, tr their true religion and virtue. Thinking most particularly today of our Prime Minister Scott Morrison and our Premier Gladys Berejiklian and all their government. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and curates, 
that they may both by thy life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments, and to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and specially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succour all them who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we think especially at the moment of the adversity of our whole community, of those that are suffering uh, economically, for those that are in fear, those that are experiencing loneliness or loss of employment, and those that are sick and unwell. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants to part of this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to give us grace so to follow their good examples that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God meekly kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honour and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ saith unto all that truly turn to him. Come unto me, all that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul saith. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John saith, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. So lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet, right and our bounden duty, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto Thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify Thy glorious name, evermore praising Thee, and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of Thy glory. Glory be to Thee, O Lord Most High. Amen. We do not presume to come to this Thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in Thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs unto Thy table, but Thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of Thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink His blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, 
Who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, and do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. And do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for thee. Preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for thee, and be thankful. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost vouchsafe to feed us who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of Thy favour and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of Thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of Thy everlasting kingdom, by the merits of the most precious death and passion of thy dear Son. And we most humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>